Now, welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney, and my name is Michael Walker. How are you today, Mark? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Always good. As per usual, we are going to talk about some board games. We're going to talk about the game we reviewed exactly one year ago, the games we played this week, the news, and why it does not matter. And then the last and final segment of our Q&A. Well, of this go-round, this is Q&A Charlie one. Bravo. Charlie Bravo. We will probably debut Delta in some time in the future. Not to be confused with Johnny Bravo, an underappreciated Hanna-Barbera cartoon. So the game we reviewed exactly one year ago was Flotilla, which came out in 2019. I would just say that because we usually don't review games that are so old. This was designed by <laughs> J.B. Howell and Michael Mihelsik and published by WizKids. And this is a game that I still have and is still in my collection and will remain in my collection. It is one of those games that has two huge phases, like we just talked about with Fjords and or Blue Lagoon, where the two phases are very distinct and still very entwined with each other. And it's a great deck building, get your engine in place, build your little flotilla, post-apocalyptic Tons of theme, interesting stuff going on. Love Flotilla. So I'd say it's more of a hand builder. It's one of the, in the Concordia style where all the cards immediately go into your hand and you have a card that cycles your cards back in. I like a lot about Flotilla. I don't like it at two and a half to three hours, which is normally how the game plays out, especially since that all-important transition from the first phase to the second phase is the most fascinating decision in the game. And the truly interesting dynamics I find in Flotilla are when some number of players are in phase one, while some other number of players are in phase two, and when those players in phase one dig in their heels, either because they're getting stubborn and they've been in miscalculation, or because they're actually going to be able to profit from people being in phase two, or or the corollary of that, of course, is people going to phrase two prematurely or somewhat earlier than expected. The problem is when you only have that one important decision point, I'm not saying it's the, the other decision points aren't important, but when that one decision point is the most interesting one, and when those dynamics frequently fail to materialize, you know, too many games of Flotilla, somebody goes to phase two, everyone follows shortly thereafter, either because the timing made sense or because of groupthink or whatever. I mean, Flotilla's fine. I've played it a couple times since we reviewed it. It's okay. I just wish that a developer had either honed down the length or maximized these points of friction and, a, and a sort of decisional asymmetry in the phases, because then I think you really would have had something excelling in that field. Yeah, that problem that you're talking about can be compared directly with Fjords, is that the first phase is just straight up building the map, and then there is that one crucial part where the two phases switch and there's those very few, very interesting and fatal decisions. And then it's just filling in the rest of the map. So it's very fiddly, but interesting in that small little segment. Luckily, Fjords is a very short game. Exactly. So you're not going to lose out too much. Whereas exactly like you said, Flotilla, if that's the one part that you really enjoy is the two segment switch over, then it is, like you said, awfully too long. And that was Flotilla by WizKids. On to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, I finally got to play Ark Nova in real life. I picked up a copy and we actually played twice this week. One with one game with three, another game with two. And there's not much more to add. The problem with the deck is even emphasized more because you physically can see the stack <laughs> of cards. Like when you're playing it digitally, it's sort of like flat and you don't really notice that there's 5 million cards that you have to search through. Uh, but, you know, there is there is something to be said for being able to see the cards in front of you and, and noticing what other people play. There's a lot more interaction with what other people are doing because you can – because you're sort of seeing what they're doing as opposed to having to move the screen around and and figure out what they're trying to do. In the, in the two-player game, a card came up, which I couldn't believe, because we were talking about how hard it is to get the cards you need. Yes. And then to add a card, which lets you 
take a card out of someone else's hand seems almost unforgivable. Well, that's one of the one of the surprising ways in which Ark Nova really is very similar to Terraforming Mars. You're entirely right to point out that in your early descriptions of Ark Nova that it is simultaneously very similar and yet utterly dissimilar to Terraforming Mars. One of the ways in which it's very similar is the pointless and gratuitous take that element, which serves for no solid gameplay purpose other than the shallowest veneer of player interaction. Plus, I, I, is it Terraforming Mars they compare it to? I thought it was Agricola, right? Because you you know you have cards that that need prerequisites to put out other cards, and you're and you're putting animals. The prerequisite like, system in Agricola and, is exactly the same. It's just and you're as putting animals and pens. Yeah. That minor improvement and, that needs one profession in order to play is just the same as that eagle you pull, which requires three birds from North America that you previously. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Good comparison. I'm just good saying, pull. solid work. To to compare the two, I know. I'm just saying it's not a good comparison to terraforming Mars, in my opinion. But anyway, back to the card that lets you take a. Card it's out one of that you've hand. made. It's a good comparison in some ways. It's really bad in others, but in some ways, it's very apt. true. There, there is a defense to it. You can you can give them $5 instead of giving them the card, but you can simply just wait till the person doesn't have $5 because money is very tight in this game and yes. then play it. And even losing the $5 can be just as devastating, right? Because you're saving up for that big animal and suddenly now you don't have the money, so you have to wait yet another whole phase to get that animal out. Anyway, I can see why people enjoy it. There is a lot there. It is sort of that build up that... That sort of promise that I'm going to get that really interesting combo this day, like the, my tableau is going to synergize and I'm going to have this cool engine, right? There's always that promise of of what might be, right? And I think maybe that is what is pulling people into games like Terraforming Mars and Ark Nova. I don't have any difficulty seeing its appeal. And indeed, there are so many things about Ark Nova that I really, really like. Married to a better deck... If Tom Lehman would just design an expansion where it's like, all right, I'm going to take the mechanics of Ark Nova and I'm going to design my own deck, I'd play that game in a heartbeat. So Ark Nova is designed by Mathis Wiggy and published by Feudalin Spiel. Played another game of Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape. It remains as stupid and as enjoyable as ever. In point of fact, somebody on the, the Patreon Discord gave me some pushback, and he was basically, the, th- the thrust of the message was, Mark, like what you're going to like and own it. Oh, I absolutely own it. The thing is, I'm very careful that when talking about my enthusiasm, when I don't think that my enthusiasm is warranted or universalizable. My enthusiasm for Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape is because I will happily play stupid dungeon crawlers, and so long as they're not terribly overlong, I will play almost any stupid dungeon crawler. The difference between Massive Darkness 2 and something like, just for example, Cthulhu Death May Die, is that the latter does something interesting, borderline subversive with its theming, uh, many more interesting mechanisms, the scenario structure is fascinating, etc, etc, etc. Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape, on the other hand, allows you to drown in treasure and kill things, which is its own kind of appeal, but not necessarily a great design triumph. And so that is the context in which I am very, very careful to hedge my recommendation, and indeed not recommend Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape. I began the long, arduous process of integrating stretch goals into the game experience. This has been a long unpacking procedure. And I've been experimenting with some of the new classes, because as I mentioned, we live in a post-root world, and all the classes have a strong degree of asymmetry. I got to play around with the wizard, who has this action wheel, where the wizard has access to a bunch of spells. Unlike in the old days in D&D, where, you know, the wizard would sit down and have to pre-prepare their spells and memorize them, uh, the wizards in Massive Darkness are kind of like on some sort of random cavalcade. They're even more arbitrary than the rogue. I talked about how the rogue's mechanisms were kind of thematically appropriate. The wizards makes no sense. It is not what inspires a sort of scholarly reflective bent. They just have four spells that go on a cycle, and when you cast a spell, you move on to the next spell. And uh, so it's kind of like this kaleidoscopic wheel of noise (laughs) that you have to manage. If anything, it would have definitely suited a more chaotic type of playstyle. It's still enjoyable. Managing the system is cool. It just doesn't have the sort of same thematic hook that it might have with other ones. And I do love me some support classes, and the Paladin class remains one of my favorites in terms of doing that. And the scenario design so far has been fine. I looked with trepidation. The second mission that I played was an escort mission. I'm like, ooh, 
escort missions are usually the bugbear of anyone who's done those in video games or in other contexts. This worked out okay. It's relatively easy to keep the person safe, and so it's just another timer element that's added on top of having to keep the, the, the area relatively clear of monsters. And so I'm looking forward to playing Massive Darkness 2 with a larger player count, uh, both because I think it will open up the ability to support other characters and because I think it will uh, ease the managerial load of having to deal with all those components. One of the tragedies of solo gaming is everything has to be within arm's reach and you're responsible for everything. Now, there's precious little upkeep in Massive Darkness 2. Some of the AI is really quite clever. The roaming monsters do very interesting things on their AI, but it's all very easy to execute. It's more just a question of being able to reach everything. What with your literally dozens of bags of minis of different types of monsters and the dozens of decks of cards. Again, I'm not exaggerating here. Dozens of different decks of cards and on top of that, the, the tokens. It's manageable. I've done it and I'll do it again. I would just rather have a whole bunch of helpful little hands so of course i can't be playing with you so i am still enjoying massive darkness 2 hellscape for what it is and if you're in the mood for something dumb and not particularly original and you like all almost all dungeon crawlers well in that context maybe i can recommend it and so that was massive darkness 2 hellscape by alex altianu and marco portugal fulfilled by cool mini or not this year I played a few video games that does that wizard thing the same sort of way where you have the same spells and you have to cycle through them in a certain order. So you like cast some spells that you don't need. So when you go into this room where you where you need a particular spell, that one is ready. Oh, really? Or the other uh, mechanic was every fourth spell would cause a stun. So you'd cycle through a bunch of spells uselessly just so the stun was ready for, you know, that spell that you wanted. Huh. Maybe that's what they're going for. I got to play a Kickstarter that just fulfilled called Foundation of Rome. So this is n- another ridiculously overpro- overproduced game. The designer is Emerson Masucci, the same designer that did Century Spice Road and Spectre Ops. It was put out by Arcane Wonders, and it really is everything I wish Big City was. Oh. You know where Big City is putting out these buildings to zero excitement and zero you know mechanics where foundations of rome is all buildings sort of key off other buildings it's very important where your buildings are it's sort of chinatown where you're where you're trying to buy certain plots of land so you can have buildings uh next next to each other it's uh you know like getting ink certain buildings have income certain buildings have population there's all sorts of uh additional modules you can add that are like larger monuments or bit bidding for the 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 land squares can't wait to play it more you get you draft a hand of like chinatown there's a grid you know six uh say nine by nine grid i'm not sure how many how many squares it is and you draft a bunch of cards randomly off the deck and then there are three phases to the game which are all the rest of the squares equally dealt into three piles and then a tableau of five cards come down and either you're uh buying a card or you're taking your income from your buildings or you're placing a building where you have the proper land divvied out for that building they're in all sorts of different shapes they're three-dimensional they look fantastic can't wait to play again everyone enjoyed it at the table if you want to check it out we have it on up on youtube foundations of rome played a game of planet unknown on the topic of various shapes and recently fulfilled Kickstarters. This was observed by one of the players as being an incredibly Kickstarter-y game. It was very evident that it came from Kickstarter. This was meant as both a compliment and as a demerit, I think, and I think that that's a very, very apt uh, comment. It is very clearly overproduced. All the things have, are markers when they could easily be tokens. And there's the lovely shade work on some of the miniatures. And there's double layer boards, triple layer boards, and quintuple layer boards. And Lazy Susan that really is, they try to pretend as though the Lazy Susan's necessary for the gameplay. It really, really, really isn't. They could have easily done with just putting out a marker next to different sections of the table and it would have been fine. But the Lazy Susan is lovely. It's a forest acronym. They never tell us what the fork acronym stands for, which I think is a tremendous oversight. But at any rate, it is a polyomino laying game. 
And one of the things that I was not ready for was the degree to which you're basically juggling several different kinds of tactical puzzles. One of the puzzles is filling in your board, because that's where a lot of your points are going to come from. Another one of your puzzles, though, is juggling the other kind of bennies that your various tracks will give you. It doesn't feel especially tracky, because basically it's not one of those things where you spend varying amounts of resources to advance various tracks. It's merely a question of every time you lay down a tile, you advance one space on two different tracks based on what kind of tile you have. And a couple of the tile the tracks are very consequential for mid-game play. There's your water track, which brought by and large is just in-game points. But then there's your tech track and your civ track, both of which can unlock in-game bonuses. And then when you layer on top of that the asymmetry on various uh, different corporation boards that have different technologies that can be unlocked, you have different layers to the puzzle. And I found it very interesting how I completely lost the plot by focusing too much on one of the puzzles while missing out on the other puzzle. Specifically, what I did was my corporation gave it incentivized you to move your rover in a certain kind of way across your planet based on the presence of energy grids. And so I built this massive energy grid in the middle of the planet. And every time my rover moved, it could go way across the planet and then zip back all the way over. Basically, it was teleporting. And all, all the rest of the people at the table were very impressed at how far and fast my rover could go. They were less impressed at the end of the game when my score was about half of what everyone else's was. Because... In classic, not being able to do spatial puzzles very well, I didn't fill in my board. And that's where a lot of the points go. <laughs> so suffice to say, despite the fact that I was basically playing the game in a radically different way than everyone else at the table, I thoroughly enjoyed it, even while I was walling around in my own mediocrity, because I still got to do cool things. And so that's something. Very much looking forward to playing it again. Uh, very easy to teach, but it has an un unhelpful reliance on very particular technical terms. It's one of those games where I thought the the instruction would be vastly simpler than it was. You know, this is Planet Unknown. You take a tile, you put it down, you advance on the tracks, move, rinse, repeat. Here's how scoring works. But as it happens, there are subtle terminological distinctions in the various Civ cards and the various powers that talk about spaces and icons and various terms that you might have forgotten when reading the rulebook and you've now parsed into normal English, and I always I always resent it a little bit when games do that, so I think that a, another couple passes with a developer to pare down the terminology and or make things more intuitively obvious would have been helpful. That, I think, is the the second edge of the double-edged sword of the compliment. This looks like it came from a Kickstarter, and indeed, that was overall my impression. So, for a very simple game, it was more difficult to internalize than need be, but nonetheless, when playing Planet Unknown, juggling those various levels and just seeing other people juggle the levels much, much better than I did was also very pleasant. I I am very much looking forward to more experience with Planet Unknown. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I said that last time when I talked about it was the tracks. They feel very much like a roll and write. You're like comboing. You're trying to get certain combos to go off because that will trigger other combos and you'll start to rocket up all the tracks at the same time because you're, you know, you have this, the ultimate combo going much like these roll and writes do. It's true, but there are better games with combos. And so when you said, hey, Planet Unknown, it's basically like a roll and write with tracks. I was like, great. <laughs> That's what it felt like to me. Mark, sure. I picked up my own copy of Ghosts of Christmas. And much like Wonder's Land War, this played out exactly the way I wanted it to, which is great. It is playing three tricks in a row and they are all interact with each other. Whoever wins the past will be the leader in the present and whoever wins the present will be the leader in the future. And your has this interesting mechanism where as soon as someone plays a card into an area that sort of sets the color, but not necessarily sets the lead. And so if you want to get, you want to play a you want to win that middle hand, but you have to play a blue, but luckily no one's played to the future yet. So you can ditch your last blue in the future. And now you can play Trump in the, in the present. All of these things are happening. It has a very harsh bidding system. It's brutal, isn't it? You have to look at your whole hand of, of 12 cards in a four player game and decide at the beginning how many tricks you're going to win. And you have to win exactly that number of tricks. There's a little bit of w wiggle room with the, by taking a red door as opposed to purple doors. But if you do that, all of your tricks are worth one point instead of two points. It is a brutal penalty and it's a brutal scoring mechanism. And I love every bit of it. Ghosts of Christmas. If you play any trick-taking games, you need to check this one out. It's designed by Taki Shinzawa and published by BoardGameTables.com, the worst name of a company ever. And while we're on that note, 
I know I've said this in the Pledge of Indifference, but I need, I because we always talk about bad things with companies. I had a great experience with board game tables. I ordered a gaming bag from them. There was an issue. They immediately fixed it. They did a great job. Boardgametables.com. Good for them. Yes, the, in Ghosts of Christmas, the disaggregation, the decoupling of having to follow suit and what color will actually be the lead? It's like, oh, I had to follow suit in green, but actually the lead color is going to be blue because of weird temporal shenanigans. Utterly fascinating and completely broke my head wide open. Really, really interesting game. Played another game of Imperium the Contention. This is the incredibly stripped down 4X-ish adjacent thing by Gary Doretsky at Contention Games. And one of the things that I want to stress, I was t- showing it to a new player, I, I, to contrast it with Planet Unknown, again, I had a great time with Planet Unknown, looking forward to playing it again. Imperium the Contention is always a game that I think is going to be harder to explain than it actually is. It's like, okay, here are the faces and we play a card, and I mean, mostly the cards are transparent. I mean, I, I keep thinking, I'm going to have to decide what an asset is. I'm going to have to talk about attaching. And he's like, no, no, it's always transparent. Like, 99% of the keywords are either incredibly straightforward and or easily referenced on the back of the rulebook, and you nonetheless get a lot of the 4X experience in all its combo-tastic and combat-related glory. The other thing that was really a welcome change, we've been playing a lot of relatively component-intensive games, and I didn't play it immediately after Massive Darkness 2, but it was also a delight to be able to just open up a small box, hand someone a deck of cards, and be done most of the setup (laughs) at that point. I didn't have to worry about a whole bunch of other decks of cards, sorting three different piles of tokens, or anything of that sort. It was very, very nice. I appreciated that a great deal. Imperium the Contention is a game we've played a lot. We gave it a full review. Huge fan of Imperium the Contention. It was very nice to go back to it. It was only two-player you played it at? Yes. Nice. So we've been playing an older game on Board Game Arena. This is called Legendary Inventors. It's designed by... Frederick Henry, the same designer that did Timeline, and it's published by Bombix. And so what you're doing in Legendary Inventors is that there'll be a row of inventions, and you have a a bunch of inventors, and they're good at, they have a bunch of skills. Either they have light bulb skills, or gear skills, or beaker skills, or compass skills, and it's one or two of each one. And then the corresponding inventions need those skills. So you can play an inventor to a invention and you fill in the squares of their, of their skills. And then it's sort of like a area majority. Whoever has the most cubes on an invention when it's finished gets first pick of the, the goals on them. So there's a bunch of different things. You can have some special abilities. You can have some number tokens that will increase the skills on your inventor's cards, or you can just score the card. So it's this interesting, you know, trade off early game, trying to get your stats up. When are you, you know, the, the typical, when am I going to start turning these cards into points as opposed to building my engine more? And I think it's a great game. I'm looking forward to trying it with you, Mark. Legendary Inventors. Played another game of Capital Lux 2. I talked last week how there was Capital Lux 2 Pocket and Capital Lux 2 Generations. I played in the Generations version, and one of the things that Generations has that Pocket does not is a solo mode. And I was intrigued by the solo mode because I'm always looking for solo modes that, number one, feel like the base game, and number two, don't have mountains of upkeep for running the AI. And I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised and impressed with the AI version of Capital Lux 2. For a card game that's very dynamic and very confrontational and very much about area majority and at the same time threatening people's positions entirely because you want more in a given suit, but the suit will be capped at a very hard limit based on what's available in a public tableau, the AI is surprisingly responsive given a very, very simple set of operations. And there's a certain amount of foreknowledge. You'll be able to look at a sideboard, which is a reserve, and the AI will play the reserve if it can, or will hold it for later rounds if it can't. And this helpfully mimics how the draft normally works, because at the top of every round, you draft the cards, so you have a sense of what your opponents will be able to play. It's more about foreknowledge than it is about denying your opponents what they need. But by the same token, there's a certain level of predictability with what cards are going to play round on round, with the slight possibility of then throwing a complete curveball that you had no way to anticipate. And so there's this lovely layering of risk about how you're approaching the the mid-round scoring. Like, okay, I'm going to win that suit, I might win that suit, I, I'm definitely not going to win that suit... 
but you have to keep in mind that there's always the possibility that they're going to top deck instead of playing from a face-up tableau. It, it's rare, but when it happens, it can be quite consequential. And that alone, I thought, was a very, very clever innovation, and it did a very good job of mimicking some of the late-round surprises that you see in a game of Capital Lux. And the AI can work with almost any of the special powers because one of the benefits of Capital X2 as opposed to Capital X1 is that every given suit can have one of four basic powers. They come in sets, but you can mix and match. But there's a very small number that the AI can't play with. And so ultimately, the challenge of a player is to be able to leverage those special powers to overcome for the fact that the AI, of course, cheats. The AI gets a certain number of compensatory advantages for being a simple deck of cards. I thought it was great. I was very pleasantly impressed. I've said before, Isla Svensson and Christian Amundsen Ostby, the two who designed Capital Lux 2, as well as the first Capital Lux, I haven't, I've never gone out to find their work, but everything that I played of them has been very solid and clever. And so I think for the future, they're going to be a pair and individually, they're going to be people I'm going to be looking out for because Capital X2 is a great game and I've been very, very pleased with my experiences with it. And the solo mode is shockingly clever. And I will say it's certainly not a component monster, but there's, there are a certain number of trailing components here and there because some of the special powers of the various suits do require, for example, their own sideboard. So there's a sideboard and four markers, one for each player color, that exist exclusively by virtue of the fact that sometimes with one of the suits, you'll be playing with this one special power. And that just goes to show two things. Number one, the variety that, that's baked into a lot of the special powers, but also number two, the fact that there can be a certain amount of component creep, even in relatively simple and elegant games like Capital X2, just to highlight one of the reasons why I was so pleased with my experience with Imperium the Contention. I can't wait to show more people Capital X2. It's been a great joy and I'm glad it was shown to me. And even the solo mode is surprisingly solid. So, Mark, I got to win my first game of Paint the Roses, which is not, you know, a gigantic feat, but it was an interesting end to the game where we needed just to place one more tile. Uh, I had placed it and I had put my cubes on and I had an easy card, which just meant that it was either it was going to be two colors they had to choose. Now, the problem is, is that they were 90% sure what the colors were but they weren't sure the number on my card because the number is going to tell you how far you move along the track. And we needed to move at least two spaces. If my card was a one, we would lose. So instead of choosing my card, they backtracked about five turns. I didn't have anything to do with this. It was the other members, other <laughs> two members. It was a four player <laughs> game. They backtracked another person's card who had placed no cubes on the board from the reasons why he didn't place cubes, figured out exactly what card he had. Oh, wow. And therefore we won. That's impressive. Quite amazing. It was impressive. I, I am torn on, it comes with a bunch of pads of paper that you can use to track information. And I'm torn on whether that is in the spirit of the game or not, because it, it makes it, you, that you have exactly 100%. You know what I mean? It just takes out the guessing and the and the chance because it's, you know what I mean? And this is just my opinion, of I course. don't know that I agree with you that it takes out the all the guessing because there are still some instances where you're going to have to rely on chance, I think, even with perfect note keeping. And I'd be hard pressed to say that it's contrary to the spirit of the game when it's included in the box. I know, but I just feel like keeping mental note of what's going on would make it more fun, in my opinion. Uh, that could very well be. That's a separate question entirely. And this is this was Paint the Roses. It is a game where you are placing tiles and making combinations of a card that you have in your hand and putting out cubes. And the, you're telling the other players what other tiles match what your card is. And then every turn you also have to make a guess. So you're trying to figure out who, what card is giving you the best chances or which ones you know for sure. And it happened in both games we've played so far where there was a couple that we knew for sure, and you sort of uh, choose one of the two to give you a better board, board position because sometimes you don't want to advance a, past a certain point on the score track, so you take the lesser one, so you just bump up against it and not quite pass it, and then you hit, hit it. Anyway, interesting strategies in Paint the Roses. This was designed by Ben Goldman and put out by North Star Games. It's interesting how the deduction, the cooperative deduction, 
sometimes has to give way, or at least is in tension with, managing the pacing of the game. Because you win or lose in Paint the Roses by virtue of the placement of either the, the rabbit or the Queen of Roses, and they advance on the track based on whether you guess correctly or incorrectly, and they advance at certain rates and so forth. And you're right, I, very very early on in some of our plays of Paint the Roses, you're like, well, I know what this card is, but if I guess this card right this turn, then I have to worry about the tracks advancing too quickly. It's it's an interesting trade-off. Finally for me, played another game of Space Alert. Space Alert is one of our favorite co-op games by Vladik Vottel. A game of utter chaos and madness where nothing ever goes right. And indeed, this was a very paradigmatic example of that case because we had our 10 minutes of, of frenetic planning and activity and running around and desperately dealing with the threats and saying, I think we've dealt with that. Now time to move on because I've only got limited bandwidth and everything seems to be on fire. However, uh, the resolution was somewhat anticlimactic because as of turn one, someone looked down at the board and said, oh, I just messed this up. We're going to die. Because <laughs> instead of doing something on turns two and three, something was done on turns one and two. I'm not going to point fingers. I was the chief of internal security. I'm a team player. I will merely point out that no internal threats caused us any problems, that I'd done my job. It would be the act of a tremendous churl to point out that it was the comms director's fault that we lost and died in a blazing fireball. And I am not a churl, so I would never say such a thing. How dare you imply that I would? Still had a great time, even though the actual resolution fell entirely flat very, very quickly, such as the way of things. Space alert. Vladik Vatel. CGE, wonderful time. Actually, I find that that's sometimes that's the funnest part. Anyway, and lastly for me, we're back to Reich Buster's campaign. We did mission N2. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It means that we're, we went through a portal and we're in a bad place. Good news is that it is a place that we're not really supposed to be. So we're back to doing interesting stealth stuff where there's like harsh line of sight because everything's pitch black and we have nothing but flashlights. They have nothing but flashlights. It was the first mission where we actually were all successful as opposed to, you know, shooting Louie ahead with the mission objective and having him sprint out and dive through the exit while the rest of us <laughs> get captured. We all, we all got through the exit. It was a very interesting game. And I think this might be a campaign that we might actually finish without having to force it. Reichbusters is designed by Jake Thornton and put out by Mythic Games. And those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Mark, we like Durance. It is a no game master type role playing game. Now there's this other game coming out called Tough Calls Dystopia. It doesn't claim to be a role-playing game. It, it claims to be a 100% negotiation game where you're on a post-apocalyptic, sorry, post-apocalyptic world. And they say there's tough decisions to be made about supplies and, and water consumption and politics and everything that Durance is, but they, for some reason, don't want to tag it with a role-playing type system. Well, sounds promising. It does. I'm very much looking forward to it. This is designed by Diego Burgos and Margata Pinto, published by Fractal Jutos. It could be one of those things where, like in human conditions, where it, it builds itself as a kind of a board game, but it's, it's very akin to an RPG in a lot of ways. You said I was a robot walker. That was very hurtful of you. Anunnaki Dawn of the Gods is back on Kickstarter. We reported on this back before when it was yanked. Uh, this is Cranio Creations' latest Kickstarter that went down in uh, somewhat ignominy the first time it was posted, but it is being co-designed by Simone Luciani, and therefore I am very, very keen on it. However, it is unclear at this point whether in the N Norse faction, whether Tyr will be represented. And people who've listened to this podcast for a while know I have very, very strict principles about when the Norse mythology is being represented, that Tyr must be present, hashtag no Tyr, no sell. They've lowered their prices. They've made the bundles more economically accessible. They haven't done anything with the VAT, but they've been up more upfront with their add-ons because Cranio loves to ship out a whole bunch of extra promos and stuff for other more successful games. They've had a very, very rocky history with Kickstarter. I have no idea whether I want to trust them with, th with this on this one, but I am very curious about some of the add-ons, like, for example, the new Barrage Board, which apparently is 
particularly well suited to two players. But at any rate, we'll see how this version of the campaign goes up this time. This is Anunnaki, Dawn of the Gods. And lastly for me, I usually don't talk about miniatures, but I haven't seen an interesting Games Workshop miniature in a while. It's always been uh, other companies where they catch my eye and have to look any. Long story short, the figure is called Arlotch the Drowner. It's like this ghost ship that appears you know, on the battlefield and it zooms across and dumps out a bunch of people. Seems pretty interesting. The model is amazing. Games Workshop is slowly upping their game back to where they used to be as being the most interesting figures on the market. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to the topic, which is Charlie Bravo questions and answers. Would you like me to go first? I'll go first. Why don't you go first, Walker? Most innovative designer that started producing in the last five to ten years. As far as innovative I'm concerned, I'd probably say Artem Nichapura, maybe Paolo Mori. Uh, there's a related question, which is influential. And uh, there I'd probably say Cole Worley and Volko Runke, even though I'm not necessarily huge fans of everything they put out. I have David Thompson and R. Eric Rose. Oh, they're both brilliant. I just don't necessarily know that it's... I, I'd, I'd put them in the same category as innovative. But uh, yeah, sure. No, I mean, two of my favorite designers of the past five to ten years, that's for damn sure. So, a designer walker that you respect for their designs, but whose games you generally don't enjoy. Vidal Lacerda, I have mm. here as my answer. Yeah. I have Cole Worley. Uh, I, I respect the heck out of his design th- philosophy, but other than Root, I haven't really liked a lot of his games. Some work of Amabel Holland, although I do like a lot of what she's done. And uh, Andrew Parks, everything but Core Worlds. I haven't liked anything but Core Worlds, but usually there's been a couple things that have been interesting. Mark, what is your favorite game that you don't get to talk about very often? Successors. I get to I get to talk about Civ a lot because it's been so influential and so foundational. Uh, but Successors, uh, I, I, I doesn't come up a lot, which is sad. It makes me sad. I haven't even played Fourth Edition yet, Walker. That's that's a travesty. Travesty. I agree. Mine is I I I talk about it only because it's my favorite game. Level Seven Invasion. Great pandemic type. Troops on a map, special abilities, love it. When is SwagCon? Never. Too much work, no time. Sorry, we'll leech off another convention and uh, and do a meetup instead. <laughs> My response is SwagCon is whenever we're in the same room. So true, so true. There have been many SwagCons. Mark, given my feelings on GMT box covers... Can we get a list of the best box covers on the market? Well, that's up to you, Walker. That's that's one squarely for you. Look, look at the Wonderlands War box. Look at the Ark Nova box. Look at the Spirit Island box. Bright, colorful, (laughs) interesting pictures. You literally have two seconds to tell a customer what the game is about and sell them on it. Because that's what the cover is for. It's for when it's in a retail store. And you need to catch the eye of a of a customer, and you need to tell them how fantastic your product is in two seconds. And remember, customers all react to aesthetic judgments though the same way Walker does, and that's the important thing. Yes, millions it, and billions of dollars in marketing has been wasted. All right. In these four plus years of podcasting together, what is the most interesting thing that you've learned about each other? Mine is that you can maintain a high level morality and not have to kill anyone. So you you you, you keep a high level mor- of morality, Mark, and you haven't killed anyone. So <laughs> I attempt to keep a high level morality, and I've killed many people. <laughs> well, I guess the most interesting thing I've learned about Walker is that he apparently has a high body count under him. Uh, no, I was uh, in all seriousness. Uh, Walker was a theater kid. I was always adjacent to theater kids. I was never a theater kid myself. I've done theater, but I was never a theater kid. I guess that's the equivalent of saying that you never really inhaled. And uh, no, Walker's a hardcore theater kid. Blew my mind. It's true. All right, so now we have a couple... Now we have a couple of things from uh, Frank. Frank is trying to be the new Sam. Gotcha. Uh, Insofar as he's desperately trying to be our new least favorite listener. Uh, So we'll start with Frank's proposition to Walker. This is Frank's hypothetical. All games in your top 20 games of all time cease to exist, never to be reprinted or redesigned. You can never play them again. In exchange, you're given an option, optional extra four hours every day to do with whatever you want. 
Kiss and Metallica both released two new amazing albums with the original lineup or lineup of your choice. Mark will physically be unable to talk to you about one topic of your choice forever, and you are given the best paintball gun on the market with unlimited ammo with an option upgraded to the latest and greatest model whenever you want for free. Do you take this deal? Why or why not? Mark, I quickly take this deal. You can keep all of that stuff. <laughs> keep it all. You give me you give me four hours a day yeah. that I get to do anything I want. Yep. I will dump the top 50 of my <laughs> top 50 games of all time. Could, could you please use that to finally get eight hours of sleep? Maybe. Doubtful. Well, of course, you're starting with two, so even if you spent all the four hours to sleep, you'd probably only get to six. No, because I'll be too much busy thinking that I could have done anything with those other four. I, I, I would not be able to sleep. <laughs> sure. So here's your proposition, Mark. All right. Same sort of deal. All games in your top 20 games of all time cease to exist, never to be reprinted or redesigned. Never play them again. This fills you with a serious sense of loss. See, I cut but that out exchange. because Frank can't tell us how to feel. You shouldn't put That's that. That's true. Like... <laughs> yeah, who's he to say in exchange? You're not the boss of me, get. Frank. You, get, you can have any Mustang that you want. Any new Macross series you want can be created, and you can be instantly transported to sit on any Supreme Court discussions whenever you want. Would you like this deal, Mark? No, hard pass. Here's why. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't just be depriving myself of the games. I would be depriving the world of some tremendous joy from a lot of these designs. That would be awfully selfish, e even if I wanted the deal, and I don't. Here's why. I have the Mustang I want. I've got a 2011 GT convertible. In beautiful shape. I got it for a song. You wouldn't believe how little I paid for this car. It's probably because I bought it in French Canada and I, I, I was able to conduct the deal in French. And, you know, you buy it in saint jean home it's a smaller market. Anyway, uh, so I've got the exact car that I want. Uh, as far as new Macross series I want, I'd probably... I'm not good at directing creative endeavors. I'd probably ask for something stupid. Actually, I'd probably ask for the uh, 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 events of the Mega Road 1 when... Kawamori has said specifically he has no interest in talking about those people ever again. That's why he had them disappear into the darkness of space. And uh, I don't want to be in the chambers with those justices. I wouldn't be able to change their minds. You think if so Sotomayor can't convince Alito to be less of a dick that I could do it? Absolutely not. So, Mark, if you could get a game reprinted by any publisher, what game and what publisher? I'd probably have Phalanx republish Civ. Phalanx is a designer with a bit of a spotty record. They're not always the best, but... Uh, they, they don't tend to be error-prone, and they probably include a whole bunch of optional rules that aren't any good. But if they could reprint Civ with the Western map, then that'd be pretty cool. Mark, you'll agree with this, I'm sure. Okay. The the 1989 Aliens game oh, produced by Simon. Good call. Oh, okay. I retract what I said. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> my, my, my pick is now Walker's one. Oh, very good call. Walker, what is your favorite League of Legends champion? Uh, oh, I only had to pick one. Oh, well, I'll pick as many as you like. Leona, Jinx, Nunu, Blitz, Sona. For yep. all those who know League of Legends, I don't have to go anymore into that. If all gaming-related hobbies magically disappeared overnight, RPGs, video games, board games, everything gone, what hobby do you think you would pick up? I think I'd probably become one of those car guys. I guess. Car guy? Yeah, probably. I was thinking... I was thinking surgery, Mark. Give myself a <laughs> self lobotomy. But uh, honestly, I think I just pick up reading again. Like I just, I really miss reading, and I just don't have time to do it. Do you guys wish you could spend more time playing the same games, or do you like constantly playing new stuff? I just think for the time being, I'm really enjoying what we're doing now, and that's churning through the new stuff. So I think uh, I'll go with that answer for now, but. Once that changes, I'm sure I'll be more than happy to go back and play the old stuff again. I mean, I, I'm both very happy playing new stuff constantly, and I also wish that there I had an outlet for some of my other gaming fields that aren't necessarily satisfied by my core gaming group, but more on that later. All right, so this is all for you, Mark. Loop okay. and Louie. Loop and Louie questions. Are you ready? Which is the definitive version to play tournament mode with? I can just answer all the questions right away. 2006 right. version. I prefer the smaller version. I find it has better bounce. Four player, obviously. I, the the non-four player versions are abominations. It need to be completely binned. Forget that loop and chewy nonsense. I don't care about that eight player version that you grafted onto your base. No. And you have to play by the tournament rules as invented 
uh, and and posted on Board Game Geek how to run a Loop and Louie tournament theory and practice. It's the only way to go. I cannot. You never let me play Loop and Louie, so I cannot comment. You sneered at Loop and Louie when I first told you about it, and I've never forgiven you for that. It wounded me deeply, and it displayed that you were a person of poor judgment and shallow moral character. And so, as a consequence, you don't get to be introduced into the Church of the Great Louis. Speaking of which, Mark, what is the most ethically bankrupt piece of media that you know? Well, setting aside actual, like, screeds of white supremacy or manifestos of of contemptible people, uh, for a long time I thought the answer was American Beauty. Uh, Alan Ball went on to do great things with Six Feet Under, but American Beauty is like a celebration of shallowness and of abdicating responsibility. I'll never forget that there's this line uttered by the villain as he pummels his son into unconsciousness, which is, there are rules in life. You can't go doing whatever you feel like. To which my response is, that's actually true. Why did you put it in the mouth of the villain as he's beating his son? And that's my ob- objection to American Beauty in a nutshell. Uh, probably more recently, I'd say Attack on Titan. I've talked about that before. Attack on Titan is a love letter to fascism. I mean, that, that's all there is to it. <laughs> Walker, what is the best large player count, relatively easy to teach game that isn't a party game? I think five is the highest you can go. <laughs> I really do. Oh, See, th- I just said I need to find outlets for other games because my core group isn't satisfying me. There you go. That's why I need to step out, Walker. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of very easy to teach social deduction games that I think are good at six, seven, eight players. Uh, Scapegoat tops out at six, but Scapegoat is wonderful. And Quest by Don Eskrich, his newest one, is very, very solid and can be played at uh, any number up to 10. Do you find it at all difficult to rate games? Do you think the people that you play a game with sometimes impact your feelings about the game? Or is your brain able to evaluate the game on some theoretical playerless vacuum? Well, we don't spend much time rating games here uh, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, that's what I have here. Rating games is for Camelotodians because that is a silly place. (laughs) Uh, Well, I disagree with that. I think that ratings have a place. It just doesn't suit our format. And it's not a question of evaluating the game in some theoretical playerless vacuum. It's that we have we tend to play with the same people. And even when we don't play with the same people, we can. it's not that hard, usually, to tell whether the social interactions that we're having that are pleasant are being are happening because of the game or in spite of the game. Again, our classic example, which I'll always go back to, is Starship Samurai. We had such a great time, got, time playing that game, but we had to, such a great time because we were ragging on the game mercilessly. Oh, and I played this card. This card is totally fair. You lose now. It's like, oh, great. Ha ha. I mean, I'm not doing justice to, to uh, the, the fun we were having, but we knew full well we were having the, the fun in spite of the game rather than become of it. It doesn't require to abstracting away to some theoretical playerless vacuum. It's just, what is the game doing and what is the group doing and what is the relationship between the two? It, it, it's, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. No, and as for ratings, I just find them silly because, you know, well, what rating it on what? You know, on... You know, you always say this, or yep. the particular player count, or this can already time again. of day, yep. Yep. or it's silly. Sure, sure. Anyway. Well, that leads to the next question, which is for me. Gotcha. I don't know if it's been mentioned before, but when rating games, Mark doesn't rate any game at 10. The highest rating is a 9.5. Why is that? Do you use a text accompanying the numbers suggested by Board Game Geek? Yes. What? I mean, it's that simple. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't share Walker's general disinterest in rating systems. I think that you can establish rating schema and you can apply them consistently. Uh, they're, the rating schema on Board Game Geeks is that, that a 10 is for a game that you always want to play and you don't think that will ever change. I do not have that that confidence in my in per, in, in you know the, the, the permanence of my gaming tastes. You know, 25 years ago I wanted to do nothing more than play long form tabletop RPGs. And I have no interest in doing that anymore. So I don't know if in, in if in twenty five years I'm I things might change. So the highest I rate things is nine point five. That's all there is to it. True, but I feel as though people can take that in context with the other ratings on Board Game Geek, and they no, can see no, what no, you rate no, other that's, that's games. Just it. No, the context 
is the ratings schema as stipulated by BoardGameGeek. I think if the, if the database is going to be useful, you use it by the schema that they set out. If I start evaluating ratings based on the context of BoardGameGeek, that, my friend, is a slippery slope to all the fools who go on BoardGameGeek and rate it a, rate a 10 to counteract the 1s, and the people who rate a 1 to no. counteract the 10 to counteract the 1. No, no, no. Because no, that's I don't, I don't mean, in the context I don't of other mean ratings other on things Geek. at BoardGameGeek. I mean, I meant your other ratings, your personal other ratings. So if you rate something at 9, they can see what other games you rated a nine in your personal list and then therefore take that into context is what i'm saying yes but then that that disaggregation that you're suggesting makes it less useful in the database because if everyone is using their nine to mean a different thing then that means that the aggregation comes like i'm look i'm not i'm not trying to get on a high horse or anything it's just if i'm going to be using a database system to, to log certain numbers i'm going to use it by the criteria they set out that's all there is to it true it's well, not that complicated. A criteria, there is a criteria for every number. So anyway. Yeah. If there's not a criteria for every number, then yes, I, I, I can and will substitute my own. But on Board Game Geek, they, they stipulate what the numbers mean, and I apply that to the best of my understanding. So Mark, what game do you think we disagree about the most? Probably Twilight Imperium. Yeah, I suppose. I, I put Spirit Island down as... You have more but respect for Spirit Island. It's true. I was, I was about to say the same thing, but yeah. I... I, I think that is very well designed and has, you know, I can exactly. see why people enjoy it. You, you don't want to play Whereas, it, but you respect it and you understand why people like it. Uh, that is not true of my views of TI4 or TI3 for that matter. I was really surprised during a scan of the 210 episode notes to see no plays or features of Le Havre or Le Harve, as Americans might say. Is the game just generally disliked by you both? Well, it is arguably Huey's favorite game. Just the fact is I do not own a copy. Huey does not own a copy. Mark, do you own a copy? I used to. I got rid of it. There we go. So in our immediate group, we do not have an available copy of Le Havre. Yeah, I would say it doesn't crack my top five Uwe Rosenberg worker placement games. I find it a little repetitive. I find the unintentional blocking unsatisfying, and every game just seems to degenerate to the same patterns. And if it's going to be that long... Uh, and that much messing around with resources. I'd rather play Aura at Labora, which is awfully similar to Lav, or indeed any number of other Uwe Rosenberg worker placement games, to be frank. I am very interested in in borrowing a copy or getting a copy. I, I want to get Huey to play it again because he played it very early <laughs> in his sort of... You want him to acknowledge his mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, no, but I, I am, I'm interested in how he would feel about it now that he's played so much more after the fact. I enjoy Lava. <laughs> I, I, I don't think, I don't have any problem, but I am interested to know whether he still enjoys it as much as he did back then. That's all right. All. Mark, when can we expect a Road to Avonlea be featured in the Masterpiece Theater segment? Never, ever, ever. Never, What's a game ever. that each of you have fond memories of playing but would never, ever play again? Mine would be Talisman. Mm. You must remember that I was alive when Talisman first came in. <laughs> so there was not much back then. There was not anything else. So it was, at the time, an interesting and good game. But I would never play it now. For me, it's Battletech. Uh, Mark, you're hosting a game. What are the rules for the table? Children? Alcohol? Language? Food or drink? Uh, What's so the deal? I swear all the time. And indeed, two of my favorite topics of discussion are politics and religion. So I don't really uh, have any expectations on that. I, I mean, I do have the rule that if someone asks you to drop a topic of conversation, you drop the topic of conversation. And I've done that before, and people have done that to me. And I think it's it's the base level of civilization, regardless of whether you're playing a game or not. I mean, within limits. Not like, well, let's just agree to disagree on, fundament, on questions of fundamental civil rights. No, no, no. I mean, while you're playing a game. Uh, children... I, I, children being around is fine. Children being involved in the games is fine. So long as it's not all the time. You know, at the point where you have a regular group and the kid shows up for some proportion of the games and so you play a game that the kid can play, that's all well and good. And we've done that a number of times. And there are a number of games that we can play with children. But if the kid's always going to be there so you can only ever play games with kids, eh, at that point, it starts to become a problem. I prefer no alcohol, but I'm not serious about it. Yeah. Yeah, when I had my Saturday groups, uh, I went with no alcohol. It's just because it wasn't the atmosphere I wanted. Sure. And there was so many people there and some of the some of the the children were very young or you know what I mean? It was like 12, 12 to sixteen. Some of the kids were coming in to play forty K. Mm -hmm. And I just yep. didn't want that atmosphere. I wanted the parents to feel comfortable. So 
And I just sort of kept that up. It's sort of, I've, I just sort of have this motto, if you need to drink to have fun, then you're doing the wrong things to have fun. I'm inclined to agree. A tabletop miniatures games also, I think, change the dynamic incredibly uh, because you're getting up, moving around. There's lots of things to be manipulated. Drinks get much more complicated and dangerous there. Also, the things that can be damaged are much, much more valuable. Mark? Yes? Why don't you have problems with the randomness in successors when you do have the problem with the randomness in TI 4th edition? This is a ridiculous false equivalence. In successors, sometimes you will lose a battle where you had numerical superiority, slight numerical superiority. The CRT in successors isn't anywhere near as bad as a lot of other games, like Sword of Rome. Sword of Rome is a nightmare. Old school 2D6 CRT that's just really, really awful. TI 4... You can have, as happened in our game, someone randomly draw an action card off the deck that completely kneecaps someone else's military for the rest of the game, and this can happen in turn one or two. Or, because of seating order, randomly because the person on your left or your right happened to take the first player marker, it can completely determine the result of a political resolution, also drawn randomly from a deck, that will completely kneecap your faction's special ability for the remainder of the game, or completely determine the economic course of things. Those are the problems that I have. It's not whether there is randomness, yes, no. That is grossly oversimplifying things. It's the level of complication. It's the level of handicap that it gives to somebody. It's how the randomness is focused, as well as just the probabilities involved. Mark, Mark, it's okay. You don't you don't have to play it ever again. Thank you. Mark, we got a 10-minute warning. Do you want to reset, or do we get through the rest in 10 minutes? We can do the rest in 10 minutes. All right, Mark, realistic or super mecha? Realistic. What about you, Walker? Do you have thoughts? I have no idea what this is even referring to. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you have board game artists that are your favorites slash drive you to consider a game? Uh, I I thought about this a little bit. Clemens Franz is by far, I think, mm. my favorite board game. You know what you're going to get. It, I know it's very standard Euro art, but in some cases it's very comforting, intriguing, cute. He's got hidden little things in all of his games. I just love his art. Uh, similarly, I like Franz Vowinkel, as far as quote-unquote standard Euro art goes. I don't know that there's any artist that would make me consider a game that I wouldn't otherwise. Uh, some of my other favorites are Vincent Dutre, Quan Chai Moria, Tanny Pettit, and they absolutely increase my enjoyment of the, of the game, but I wouldn't consider a game exclusively because of the artist. On that topic, Walker, would you become a diehard GMT fan if they had hired Quan Chai Moria, Beth Sobel, and Manny Tremblay to do their box, their box covers? Mark, I am a GMT fan. I love <laughs> it's almost all of their games. Their box art <laughs> drives me <laughs> mentally insane. <laughs> Mark, how did you end up Pokemon Master of Canada? What did that involve? And what other gems are on your CV <laughs> of your misspent youth? I ended up as Pokemon Master of Canada because I worked for Nintendo in their promotional arm for a couple of years, and uh, this was this was back when I was in in undergrad. So this was this was side work, and I just happened to have I, I happened to have the theory that if I was going to be working promotions for Nintendo, I ought to know about the product, and so I boned up on the necessary information. I, I, I this is this is just how I approach things. Same way I approach board games, right? I'm interested in this thing. I'd like to learn more about it. In that case, it was more professional obligation. And uh, what did it involve? I ran quizzes. I distributed merch. I displayed my superiority in Pokemon Stadium, which was the Pokemon game at the time when I was working for them. It was not very exciting. In point of fact, it was mostly just working in promotions. And as far as other things from my misspent youth, I've done a variety of things for money. The polite term for what I am is a dilettante. Yikes. Walker, we haven't heard much about Steel Team Flicks, the only game that matters in a while. Has it been replaced as the only game that matters? I don't think so, Mark. You've been AFK for almost a year, and it's just a game that you and I really enjoy. So over we just a year. Had time I have over been, a year, so we haven't... I've been cruelly separated from my board game collection. That's why we haven't played it. It's been in my basement that I haven't been to in 13 months. So thank you for reminding me of that painful event, listener. Mark, do you still your yikes? Mark, do you still consider yourself a war gamer? What games open your eyes more than war games? If I wanted to start playing war games, which ones should I try first? Solo or two player preferred? 
I was never primarily a war gamer, so it's not like I started in war gaming and then my eyes were open. It was the other way around. I started in Euros and then I, I started broadening my horizons. And I still consider myself a war gamer, even though I don't have many outlets for it. It's more a question of, of, of preference and proclivity rather than actual activity, I guess. So it's a more aspirational title, I suppose. And, uh, you know, the, the, the recommended war games are definitely any of the Undaunted series or the Commands and Color series. Pick your favorite time period and try to find an entry-level war game for that. And if you want to jump into something a little bit denser, uh, I would suggest Combat Commander. I think those are all very accessible games that nonetheless feel, uh, give you a little bit of the feel of historical war gaming. Relatedly, why aren't there any low-luck, diceless war games like Gloomhaven is for dungeon crawls? And then the speculation is they can't be abstracted or not 0% luck. Okay, so in, in this incredibly narrow category, there are lots of no-luck war games for what it's worth. I mean, Rachel Simmons did a whole bunch. Uh, Meltwater is a great example of a no-luck war game. There are tons of ones from the old SBI days and, and some of the Avalon Hill stuff. But uh, I'd just like to push back on one particular notion here that's implied, that the mere existence of dice means that it's high variance. In lots of war games, you're rolling like a fistful of 30 dice at once. You realize how flat the probability curve is when you're rolling that many dice, I would argue that in lots of buckets of dice war games, the probability curve is a lot flatter than in an average game of Gloomhaven, just saying. My answer is that if you took out the luck or the variance, then it would become very procedural. And in some of these games that take a long time, you want to give the the player uh, a thought that they might actually come back. With just a little luck, a couple good rolls, they might get back in this game. I just need to defend Australia and I'll be fine. <laughs> I don't understand why people will overlook the randomness in cards and chit pulls, but the moment a die is involved, is like, ooh, too much variance. Depends on how it's used. Walker, are there any designers where you separate the art from the artist? I thought this was directed at you. I was supposed to read this question. Mark, are there any designers <laughs> where you separate the art from the artist? Uh, yes, all of them, actually. I mean, people all the time good... want to get me wor worked up about the political views of this, that, and the other. If it doesn't impact the gaming world, I don't care. Agreed. That's why I didn't want to answer it. I knew you were going to say that, and you'd say it much better than I would. <laughs> Mark, naming things is hard. <laughs> What's the best game with the worst name or the worst game with the best name? Uh, best game with worst name, I would say Quest, if for no other reason than try to find that on Board Game Geek. Good luck. And Samurai, also, it depends on which one you're talking about. There's like 12 games with that exact same name. I was thinking Starship Samurai. I think, st I put Starship Samurai for worst game with the best name. Starship that's what Sa I mean, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah. That's what I mean, worst game with the best name, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Starship Samurai is a baller name, yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> what about, what about best it... game with worst name? I I want to say Agricola. I put down Agricola. Really? I just, it's such, I just think it might push people away from it. It's such an odd name. You know what I mean? Like if you're trying to bring people into the hobby and you and you say, we're going to play Agricola. And, Fair and enough. It's like, what the hell does that mean? Latin is not very popular. It's true. Walker, what is your all-time favorite FLGS and why? Well, as you know, Mark, we've only had one pretty well primary store here in Kingston. And they do a fantastic job. Luckily, thankfully for us, they've got a gigantic store with a huge playing area. Very welcoming. They give us a game night once a week and they don't charge any money. They have a library there that you can take games from. And they are constantly getting in new games. It's not as though they just let games, you know, uh, collect dust. They're doing uh, big sales to get rid of the older stock and constantly bringing in new stuff. Nexus in Kingston. Uh, for me, it's probably uh, Le Ballet de Coeur in Montreal. I mean, I, I'm loathe to endorse uh, commercial enterprises, uh, but Le Ballet de Coeur is kind of where I became a Euro gamer and started really developing my tastes and exploring new stuff. And uh, I made a lot of friends through the Le Ballet de Coeur, which sadly I've lost touch with, but uh, I had a lot of great experiences there. Not that I have anything against the one in Kingston, of course. All right, Mark, take us away. Last question. What game would you pick as the game that best represents you? And what game would you pick for the other and why? Let's start with you, Walker. I think Space Hulk. Because <laughs> you take up space and you're a Hulk? Because you know, Mark, I, I, I love on the edge of your seat, huge odds against you, heroic last-ditch efforts, that one roll that you need, getting around that one corner, odds stacked against you type of game. That's me. 
Space Hulk. <laughs> and what would you pick for me? I think Civ games represent, I think for me, I was trying to think of something clever, but, you know, a portrayal of all sorts of different civilizations, uh, negotiation, uh, you know, working with the other players, bullying the table, that kind of thing, I think that represents how I feel. All right. Well, the one that I think best represents me is Raw, because when I think about Raw, I think a game of uh, prioritizing, of having limited opportunities and doing the best with what you've got. And when I look back at my life, I think that any success I ever have, it's always because I've been able to find a way to get by with the minimum necessary requirements. And <laughs> And I've been very pleased with what I've been able to achieve with what I've had available to me. <laughs> and as for the game that I would pick to represent Walker, I would actually pick Thulu Death May Die. And the reason why is because it is a very deceptive looking game that seems incredibly shallow, but in point of fact has hidden depths. <laughs> what? Thanks. Nothing. Nothing at all. You're welcome. What? I was asked a sincere question. I gave a sincere <laughs> answer. I didn't say anything. <laughs> it's true, you didn't. Well, that is going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games and the third installment of Omnibus Questions. We appreciate very much everyone who sent in questions, and we hope you it found the answers at least somewhat illuminating and or distracting. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at sowronggames.com slash contact, and you'll find all our content information therein. We will read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. We hope to see you again next week, and thank you again for joining us. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>